Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on uh, lipid modification of proteins. In this video, what we're going to talk about is palmitoylation in more detail than we did in the video on introduction to lipid modifications of proteins. So we're going to talk about palmitoylation of proteins, which means adding uh, palmitic acid groups are onto um, protein proteins. Okay, so we'll add them specifically onto cysteine residues within proteins. So palmitoylation of proteins. So the structure for this video then, what we're going to start off with is a discussion of the structure of palmitic acid and therefore what a palmitoyl group actually is. We're then going to talk about the two different types of palmitoylation, uh, N-palmitoylation and S-palmitoylation, okay? And then we'll focus in on S-palmitoylation. So we're just going to mention N-palmitoylation and then we're specifically going to look at S-palmitoylation in a lot of detail, okay? Um, this is because S-palmitoylation is more, uh, more common, okay, than N-palmitoylation and uh, also more is known about s palmitoylation. Okay, so we'll talk about s palmitoylation. we'll talk about the enzymes which participate in uh, s palmitoylation, and also the enzymes which uh, participate in d palmitoylation. Okay, right. So let's start off then with the structure of palmitic acid, okay? So the star of the show as it is. Okay, so palmitic acid. Okay, and palmitic acid is the old biochemist name for a molecule that is now more properly called hexadecanoic acid. Okay, and hexadecanoic acid is a better name for this molecule than palmitic acid because it tells you exactly what this is. It's a 16 carbon fully saturated carboxylic acid. Okay, so let's start by drawing the carboxylic acid group here. And we need 16 carbons, so here is carbon 1. We then need another 15. Now, 14 of these are going to be in methylene groups. So I'll draw a methylene group here. Now, because I don't want to draw 14 methylene groups out, what I can do is draw a single methylene group, put brackets around that single methylene group, and then put a 14 down here to say, repeat this 14 times. So that's a nice, useful trick uh, to avoid having to draw out 14 identical repeating methylene groups. Okay, and then finally, right on the end, you have a methyl group, which takes us up to 16 carbons. So remember, the carboxylic acid carbon counts as carbon 1. We've then got 14 here, and the final one over here, number 16, is here. So that takes us up to 16. So hexadecanoic acid. So this is the structure of palmitic acid. Okay, right. Now, you're not actually going to add on palmitic acid directly onto proteins. Instead, you're going to use uh, a molecule known as palmitoyl coenzyme A. Okay, so basically this is uh, palmitic acid linked via a uh, thioester link to um, a coenzyme A molecule. So palmitoyl coenzyme A. Okay, and coenzyme A is often abbreviated just CoA for short. Okay, so coenzyme A has a thiol group. Okay, so we're not going to draw out the full structure of coenzyme A. We're just going to draw it with a thiol group coming off here. Now, a thiol group is a sulfur atom bound to a hydrogen atom, and I would encourage you to think of it as being very like an alcohol group. Okay, so this is a thiol group. Sulfur and oxygen are in the same group of the periodic table. So if you imagine replacing this sulfur atom with an oxygen atom, you would then have an alcohol group. And thiol groups uh, undertake many similar reactions to alcohol groups, basically. So what's going to happen is we're going to react this thiol group of the coenzyme A molecule with the carboxylic acid group of the palmitic acid molecule, okay? Just like we would uh, react an alcohol group with a carboxylic acid group to form an ester link. Okay, so let me show you what we'll get. Okay, so if I draw out our palmitic acid molecule again, so here is the methyl group right at the end here. Then we've got our 14 methylene groups here. 
So here's one of them. And now I'll put brackets around there to put 14 at the bottom here. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take off this alcohol group here. We're going to take off the hydrogen from the thiol group. We'll bind those two together to make water. We'll then link the carbon to the sulfur atom, just like we would link the carbon to the oxygen if this was an alcohol group. And then the coenzyme A will be sat here. Okay, so this link is called not an ester link, but a thioester link. Okay, so it's just like an ester link, except that you've done it with a thiol group rather than an uh, alcohol group. And this molecule that we now have here is palmitoyl coenzyme A, or just palmitoyl CoA for short. Okay, right, so this is what you're going to use uh, to uh, palmitoylate proteins. So, let me now talk about the two different types of palmitoylation, which are N-palmitoylation and S-palmitoylation. Oh, uh, okay, so um, we have our polypeptide here. So, let's say this represents our polypeptide. And remember, polypeptide is a polymer of amino acids. So, it's amino acid after amino acid after amino acids. So it's this string of amino acids. Okay, now you have a first amino acid and a last amino acid. So here is the first amino acid and here is the last amino acid. And the first amino acid has a free amino group, okay? Because usually, if we pick an amino acid in the middle here, the amino group will be involved in binding to the carboxylic acid group uh, of the amino acid before it, okay? Uh, and it will be in this amide bond, so it won't be a free amino group. But the first amino acid in the polypeptide doesn't have any amino acid prior to it. So its amino group isn't going to be involved in any uh, peptide link, basically, so it's going to be free. Similarly, uh, the last amino acid in the polypeptide, it's going to have a free carboxylic acid group over here, because usually, if you're just an amino acid in the middle, your carboxylic acid group will be involved in binding to the next amino acid uh, along, um, and it will bind to its amino group, okay? So it will be involved in the peptide link. However, of course, the last amino acid doesn't have a amino acid after it, so its carboxylic acid group will be free, okay? So this end of the um, polypeptide is called the amino terminus, okay? Whilst this end over here is called the carboxy terminus. Okay, and they're also known as the N-terminus and the C-terminus. So the amino terminus is also called the N-terminus. So I might put amino slash N-terminus. And the carboxy terminus is also known as the C-terminus. Okay, now, basically, there are two forms of palmitoylation. Now, in both cases, you will palmitoylate cysteine residues, okay? So it's always going to be cysteine amino acids. Now, let me just show you the structure of a cysteine amino acid. Now, I'm going to draw the cysteine as though it is a cysteine that's one of these amino acids that's in the middle of the polypeptide, okay? So I'm going to draw a cysteine residue, as it's called. So, here's the amino group, but it's no longer free. It's involved in binding to the carboxylic acid group of uh, the amino acid that was before it. Okay, then we have the alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off it. And then, again, you'll have the carboxylic acid group, but this will be involved in uh, binding to the amino acid that comes after it. So, let's say that we're talking about this amino acid here in green. So, the amino group will be involved in binding to the carboxylic acid group of the amino acid in front of it, and the carboxylic acid group will be involved in binding to the amino group of the amino acid that comes after it. Okay, right. Then the R group of a cysteine amino acid is that you have a methylene group, like so, and then a thiol group coming off it. Okay, so this is the structure of a cysteine amino acid. Okay, or a cysteine residue, because we're talking about the cysteine amino acid within the polypeptide, so it's often called a residue. Okay, right. Uh, now, this is the structure of a cysteine amino acid that's in the middle of the polypeptide strand.
Okay, now you can add palmitol groups onto cysteine amino acids uh, that are in the middle of the polypeptide strand. And by the way, the single letter amino acid code for cysteine is just to write a C. Okay, and when you add palmitol groups onto uh, cysteine amino acids that are within the middle of a polypeptide, this is known as S palmitoylation. Okay, because we are going to add the palmitoyl group uh, onto uh, the sulfur of the thiol group of the R group of cysteine. Okay, so let me show you what's going to happen. Basically, what you're going to do is cut off this hydrogen here. Okay, so we're going to cut this bond between the sulfur and the hydrogen. Now, covalent bonds consist of two electrons, one from each of the two members of the bond. So the sulfur atom provided an electron and the hydrogen provided an electron. Imagine giving the electron from the hydrogen back to the hydrogen and the electron from the sulfur back to the sulfur. Now also cut this bond between the carbon and the sulfur of uh, palmitoyl CoA. Okay, imagine giving one of the electrons back to the sulfur and one back to the carbon. Now, this is not supposed to be an electronic mechanism. This is supposed to uh, just help you to understand the reaction. So, do not take this for an electron flow diagram. Okay, um, so what you're then going to do is you're going to bind this hydrogen that we've chopped off here to this sulfur atom of the coenzyme A to regenerate uh, the coenzyme A, basically. Then you're going to attach this carbon to this sulfur atom, okay, to create a cysteine residue that has a palmitic acid molecule dangling off it, or a palmitoyl group as it's called. So let me now show uh, the cysteine residue with a palmitoyl group dangling off it. Okay, so here's the amino group, here's the alpha carbon, here's the carboxylic acid group, okay, which will be bound to the amino group of the next amino acid along, and the R group of uh, cysteine, you have a methylene group, then you have this sulfur atom, which will then be linked to uh, the carboxylic acid group of our palmitic acid molecule, like so, via again what's known as a thioester link. Okay, so... We have 14 methylene groups in our palmitic acid, and then finally a methyl group right on the end here. Okay, so when you stick palmitol groups onto cysteine residues that are in the middle of the polypeptide, it's known as S palmitoylation of the protein, okay, because we have added the uh, palmitic acid uh, molecule onto a sulfur atom, okay. So, uh, this process of adding uh, a palmitoyl group onto a cysteine amino acid is called palmitoylation, and you would then say that the cysteine was palmitoylated. Okay, right. Now, there is also a process called N-palmitoylation. Now, this is quite different from S-palmitoylation. You're now going to add this to uh, the amino group rather than the... Uh, sulfur atom of the R group, okay? Now, it's still going to occur on cysteine residues, okay? So, it doesn't change the fact that we are dealing with cysteine here, okay? But you can only do n palmitoylation of a protein if the first amino acid of your polypeptide is cysteine. Now, you might say, hang on a moment, I, uh, there's a set amino acid that is always at position 1. That's methionine, isn't it? And let me just explain this. So basically, if we have a ribosome here, okay, and we have our piece of mRNA here, and it's synthesizing off a protein here, okay, so this is the mRNA, the messenger RNA, okay, and we've been producing some polypeptide here. Right, so basically, in order to start the process of translation, you need the start codon uh, on the mRNA strand, which is the codon A, adenine, U, uracil, and then G for guanine, which is quite helpful because it's 
AUG, and you can think of that as being short for augment, if you like. That's a useful way of remembering what the start codon is. And augment means to make bigger, so it's kind of fitting that, you know, uh, AUG is the start codon, so that because you're about to make a polypeptide strand, and it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger kind of thing. Okay, so that's just a little way of remembering that the start codon is AUG. Now, basically, um, AUG codes for an amino acid, and that amino acid is the amino acid methionine. Okay, so, when you initially synthesize your polypeptide, the first amino acid in that polypeptide will absolutely always be methionine. Okay, however, this is what's known as the initiator amino acid. Okay, and you don't necessarily have to keep it. Often, the methionine will be chopped off, and then effectively, the second amino acid of the polypeptide becomes uh, the first amino acid. So often, the initiator amino acid will be chopped off the polypeptide. So you could end up, therefore, with a cysteine amino acid in position 1. So, let's say we do have a cysteine amino acid in position 1. Okay, so let's put this in. So now we've got our free amino group, because we're talking about the position 1 amino acid, and therefore the amino group is free. Okay, but the carboxylic acid group will not be free, because that will be involved in binding to the next amino acid along. So we're now talking about this amino acid here. So I'll underline it in pink. We're talking about that amino acid, whereas s palmitoylation we were talking about this arbitrary green one that was just anywhere uh, within the polypeptide strand. Okay, so the R group is still the same, so you still have this methylene group uh, with this final group coming off it here, but this time you're not going to add the palmitoyl-CoA group or you're not going to add the palmitoyl group, onto um, the sulfur atom. Instead, you're going to add it onto this free amino group that you've got here. Okay, so again, what you're going to do is break a bond between this nitrogen and this hydrogen. Okay, so you'll give one of the electrons back to the nitrogen and one will go to the hydrogen. Then, again, you'll bring in a molecule of palmitoyl coenzyme A, and you will break the palmitoyl coenzyme A down. You'll break this bond here and imagine taking one of these electrons back to the carbon and one back to the sulfur. Give this hydrogen atom that you've now got off here to this uh, sulfur atom here to regenerate the coenzyme A. Okay, and I think I might just label that up as coenzyme A. Okay, and then what you're going to do is attach this carbon of the uh, palmitic acid molecule onto uh, this nitrogen down here, okay, to produce a palmitic acid uh, molecule attached onto this amino group. So let's draw that out on the next page. So, what we now have is here is our amino group. It still has a single hydrogen, and then off this you'll have the um, carboxylic acid group that is now linked to this amino group, and then the R group, you have 14, oh sorry, this isn't the R group, then the tail of the palmitic acid molecule, you have 14 methylene groups, and then a methyl group coming off here, like so. Then we have the alpha carbon here, and now here's the R group of the cysteine amino acid, so with the methylene group, and then the thiol group here, and then the carboxylic acid group below. And of course, it will be bound to the next amino acids along. So this is how we can add a palmitic acid molecule onto uh, a cysteine amino acid that's at the uh, first amino acid position of the polypeptide. Okay, so that's called n palmitoylation. Now, these processes do not just occur spontaneously. They need enzymes to catalyze them. And the enzymes which catalyze s palmitoylation are different from the enzymes which catalyze n palmitoylation. Okay, we now are going to focus in on s palmitoylation. So the first one that we looked at, because it is far more common. Okay, now before we look at the enzymes which catalyze s palmitoylation, let's talk about uh, the significance of a protein having palmitoyl groups uh, stuck onto it. Okay, so uh, basically, um, if we have a protein here, and I'm just going to draw the plasma membrane, 
okay? If we have a protein here, let's say this is our arbitrary protein, and I'll just draw a rectangle here. So this is a protein. Basically, you can add palmitoyl groups onto the protein, and you don't just have to add one, you can add multiple palmitoyl uh, groups onto the protein. So let's put these here. So let's say here are a few palmitoyl groups that we've just added on. And the significance of adding palmitoyl groups is that once you've got these palmitoyl groups on like this, it targets the protein for the phospholipid bilayer. So basically, these palmitoyl groups will want to embed into the phospholipid bilayer. And I'm sorry that it's suddenly shrunk down so much. This is just the protein moving to the phospholipid bilayer and implanting into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer there. So those are those three palmitoyl groups there. So basically, proteins which get palmitoyl groups stuck onto them end up implanted into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. So remember, the phospholipid bilayer has two layers of phospholipids. Uh, the inner layer is known as the inner leaflet, okay, and this faces the cytoplasm of the cell, and the outer layer is then known as the outer leaflet. Okay, so proteins which get palmitoylated uh, end up um, you know, implanted or anchored into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. Now, what's the significance of this? Well, these proteins are generally involved in uh, transmembrane signaling cascades. Okay, so this protein will generally be involved in some signaling cascade. So, for instance, a very famous example would be the uh, heterotrimeric G uh, protein, alpha S subunit. Okay. Um, this is palmitoylated and is targeted, therefore, for the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, and of course, it's very important in um, the signaling downstream of G-protein coupled receptors. It's responsible for the GS pathway, and it goes on to activate adenylyl cyclase enzymes, which are also in the uh, phospholipid bilayer. Okay, now. There's a beautiful, beautiful thing that people are very interested in now, which is that palmitylation is not a permanent modification, okay? These palmitol groups can be stuck on and then they can be removed off. So what would happen if we went to this important protein that is now targeted in the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer and cut off all of its palmitol groups? Well, it would fall off, basically. The palmitol groups, the, well, the now palmitic acid molecules, would remain in the phospholipid bilayer, and the protein would float back into the cytoplasm, i.e. it would be removed from the phospholipid bilayer. Now, do you think if the protein's floating around in the cytoplasm, it's going to be able to take part in transmembrane signaling anymore? Well, mo these cascades are happening at the plasma membrane, uh, for the most part, until they become a cytoplasmic. Uh, response. So, for instance, if we look at the GS pathway, you'll have a, a G protein coupled receptor that's in the plasma membrane, and it will need to act on the uh, heterotrimeric GS G protein, and that needs to be, you know, in the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer so that it can actually act on it. If the substrate for this receptor is, you know, dangling around in the cytoplasm, it's not going to be able to do anything. So, basically, by removing the palmitol groups from proteins, you can regulate uh, signaling pathways, and that's why there is so much interest in palmitoylation of proteins and how they target, um, you know, proteins to the uh, plasma membrane. Okay, so we will continue this discussion in the next video where we will uh, talk about S-palmitoylation in more detail and look at the enzymes uh, which catalyze uh, S-palmitoylation of proteins.